Coming up, former race winner Paul Kayar joins Ama Sports One. The guy's good. He's one of the best, if maybe he's the best. He just ups the ante course. He ups our whole school base uh, in every way possible. A sailing showdown as the Volvo crews take on the America's Cup legends. Once in a lifetime, for sure, a depth of, uh, of talent, the amount of medalists and stuff, it was outstanding. And the inside story, we find out what life's really like on a Volvo 60. You never ever dry in here. It's, a, it's like living in, a, in an old fridge. This was the arrival the rest of the fleet was fearing. Paul Kayard, the current title holder, here to join Grant Dalton on Amma Sports One. I got to Auckland and said, OK, what are we going to do? What are we going to do to make this thing faster? As tactician, he's a significant addition to the campaign. I think he brings everything, you know. I mean, the guy's good. He's one of the best. Maybe he's the best. Uh, I'm sorry, he brings expertise in driving and, 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 and just physical drive as well. Technically, he won this league out of Auckland last time and he won it easily. Uh, I mean, he brings it. He brings experience everywhere for us. He just ups the ante for us. He ups our whole school bus uh, in every way possible. Paul will give the campaign the adrenaline boost that Grant was looking for and send a message to the rest of the fleet that this team is now a significant player. I'm sure that having the defending or the current winner show up is news, and that's flattering, but... Uh... You know, we'll just have to see how it goes. I can't make any promises. I'm not expecting to, you know, miraculously carry the boat around the course or anything like that. I can just do, what, you know, the best job I can. If I was on another boat and I heard that Cade was coming to sail with whoever, and I would go, damn. There's no doubting his ability. Last time round aboard EF Language, he dominated this race from the start. Only three times was he off the podium in nine legs. It's been the most outstanding single experience of my life. Having won the title on his first attempt, he vowed not to return to round-the-world racing, wanting to concentrate his skills on the America's Cup. But now he's back and determined to make a mark. In the long leg, usually the good, you know, get through. On a short leg, you can have the one moment of a strange happening, and then it's kind of like you can, if you can hang on for two days, you can keep that place. But over 23 days, the, the good boats will come through. Are you nervous at all? Um, I'm not nervous about myself or my own capabilities. You know, I've got slight nervous. I'm more nervous this time about the danger aspect than I was four years ago. Um, maybe it's just I've had too much time on my hands to think about it, and I just need to get more busy with all the work. But uh, yeah, slightly nervous. This move could turn out to be professional suicide. He'll have to play second fiddle to Grant Dalton, the man he beat in the last race. And if the boat's performance doesn't improve, they'll claim he's lost his edge. So what's in it for him? That's a great question, because I thought about that a lot myself. And, you know, what is really in it for me? I've, I've won this leg, I've won the whole race. And I guess what's really in it for me is it's just an adventure. And um, I... I really learned a lot about myself and what really is important to me in my life from the last round the world race and really hard conditions and very extreme places is a very unique experience and not many people in this world have the opportunity to, to have that much adventure in their life. An adventure it may be, but it's not the high profile leadership role you'd expect from one of sailing's greatest talents. I can't see there's a lot in this for Paul because he's on a hiding to nothing. But on the other hand, there he sits in San Francisco, fretting, languishing, one of the finest sailing talents in the world, sidelined, because at the moment, the America's Cup syndicate with which he was signed up, Oracle Racing, Larry Ellison's Oracle Racing, don't want him. So it's very frustrating for him to sit and do nothing. With his America's Cup plans on hold, is there a chance he'll stay on for the rest of the race? I'm not highly motivated to take it on in the big way that I did with EF or that Grant has had to take it on here and really live this thing for a year and a half and push hard for that long and do all the legs and be away from my family all that much. At the moment, he's on board for just one leg, replacing Dee Smith, who has a shoulder injury. But whatever his long-term plans, there's no doubt his arrival will give the rest of the fleet a wake-up call and make the competition tougher than ever. Many of the yachtsmen competing in this race started their careers as dinghy sailors. 
Former world champion Stig Westergaard from the Juice Dragons, Ilbrook's Stu Bannantyne and Richard Clark all raced in the highly competitive Finn class. So when the opportunity to take on the world's best in an all-star event came along, they and several other Volvo sailors jumped at the chance. We got the world champion here, uh, you know, Sebastian Godford, and we got some good sailors here. So those are the guys you got to watch out for. All of us uh, has-beens are going to try and keep up and uh, give them a, you know, give them a good fight. I don't think I've ever seen such a quality field. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I feel a little intimidated, a little nervous. We're all fin sailors, and we all want to win. It's rare to have so many of the world's best competing in one event. The 40-man list read like a who's who of yachting and included the likes of Team New Zealand's America's Cup skipper Dean Barker and perhaps the greatest of them all, three times world champion and America's Cup winner Russell Coots, who won an Olympic gold medal in the Finn class back in 1984. Not happy with his boat, though, he had to make a few last-minute adjustments before he could start. As expected, racing was extremely close. Fin sailing requires tremendous skill, strength and agility. Being big like America's Cup grinder Craig Monk is also a huge help in keeping the boat upright. And he took the honours in the first race, but the Volvo sailors were holding their own. Stig Westergaard and Richard Clark finished fourth and fifth. While Anthony Nossiter, watched by his crewmates on Deduce Dragons, came in a creditable sixth. New Zealand America's Cup legends Dean Barker and Russell Coots were struggling though. I haven't sailed a fin since the uh, 1984 Olympics. Yeah, really good fun, good racing, and it's uh, it's a credit to the organisers that they pulled this together. Pretty nice to be able to go out there and, and sort of uh, beat you know, beat everyone if you can. But it's um, you know, some pretty good fin sailors here, and uh, you know, a lot of them haven't sort of forgotten how it's done. That's for sure. It's just a good fun day. Everybody here is uh, here for a good time and most of us haven't sailed fins for 10 years and uh, you look at Russell and myself, we slip back down to um, our fighting weight which is 10 or 15 kilos less than when we sailed fins. Glenn Burke may be lighter but he is a former world champion and still good enough to win the second race in this clash of the titans. Fellow Ilbrook team member Stu Bannantyne won race three and that was enough to see him finish third overall, the highest placing for a Volvo sailor. Oh, awesome. A little bit of luck involved, but that's part of the game. One of the good things is that it's two out of three for Ilbrook. Not surprisingly, though, it was current world champion Sebastian Godford who won the regatta. It's pretty nice to, to be in that company and uh, to belong more or less to the same group. Once in a lifetime, for sure, the depth of, uh, of talent and amount of medalists and stuff, it was outstanding. You know, as you saw out there, very, very tight racing, and uh, yeah, no one's given an inch, and everyone's pretty damn good. It's a great honor in that field, because it is a very, very strong, and I would think some of the best sailors ever to assemble in one race. There's seven or eight Olympic medals here, and everyone but two, two people have not won a world championship, so, so it's a great event, and we should do it more often, maybe. It will be difficult to repeat such an event, but if New Zealand keep the America's Cup, Auckland could host another all-star Finn regatta in four years' time. It's all change on the women's boat, Amma Sports 2. Lying last overall, Lisa McDonald was desperate to make changes, and she's focused on key areas. Navigator Genevieve White has gone. Brought in just five days before the start of the race, this was always going to be a difficult job. And as navigator, any mistake is very obvious. She took much of the blame for their poor performance. Sure, there were times when there was a lot of pressure from the crew because, you know, they were, they, there's been frustration. Uh, we've had bad luck, we've, had, we've missed weather systems and um, it's easy to finger point. Another key departure is Sharon Ferris, one of their main helms. She's well aware of the challenge that faces the new crew members who've yet again come in at the 11th hour. It's a big pity that this team did not have longer. And, I mean, you can't beat that. I mean, like, Jen came in something like five days before the start. I mean, we had our drivers, not even some of them, 
driving this boat before we started in England. And you cannot be competitive in a race like this where the other teams are so well organised, they're so professional. They've been together for two, two and a half years. Their budget's three times ours. And simply, they've gone around the world more time. They have more experience. But the girls are not going to get the chance or the experience if they don't go around. To replace them, Lisa McDonald has recruited two of Britain's best women sailors, Emma Richards and Miranda Merrin. The pair have enjoyed great success sailing double-handed on the Transact Jab Barb and on Tracy Edwards' Royal and Sun Alliance. Miranda has been brought in to replace Genevieve White as navigator. With just under a week to prepare, she has a huge task ahead. To come in as navigator against the world's best navigators in, uh, on other boats, I couldn't possibly hope to be anything like as good. There is certainly quite a bit of pressure because uh, I know that changes were made in the hopes that the performance would improve. Um, I'm not entirely sure that my presence alone is, is going to change that. But despite the pressure, Emma Richards is keen to take on the challenge of the Southern Ocean. If I was told I could only pick one leg of the whole race, this would be it anyway. So for me, it's the perfect time to come in. I love, um, I love big wind, uh, downwind sailing. And um, so we'll have a couple of days to get used to the boat before we hit the Southern Ocean. And then um, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. So with just under a week until the start of leg four, Lisa McDonald faces the daunting task of bringing in a new navigator and helm ready for the Southern Ocean. So is she confident the new signings will make a difference to the leaderboard? I do hope so. I mean, it, it's all about finding the right combination of people working together. It's difficult when you do start at the 11th hour. You just don't have that training ground in which you can see who's going to work best together and whose skills bring what to the party. And I'm confident that these changes will be made for the better of our team. Coming up after the break, down below on a Volvo 60, what life is really like. And remember, if the bank stays like this, you roll out. So, up she goes. Very uncomfortable, the coffin. And lost in paradise as the Volvo crews navigate New Zealand. We were like 10 minutes ahead of them. But then our runners got lost a bit. The Volvo 60s are the cutting edge of monohull design. Built of Kevlar, they're stronger than steel, yet a fraction of the weight. With a huge sail area, they're able to reach record-breaking speeds, SEB covering 460 nautical miles in 24 hours. A one-design fleet, the boats all have to conform to the race rules, but there are areas that can be changed to give a speed advantage. Below deck has to be pared down to the minimum to save weight, making living conditions very uncomfortable. So what is life like on board? Richard Mason gives us the guided tour. Welcome inside the lady. This is the living room, the lounge, the TV room, the kitchen, the bathroom, and this is the generation plant. Pretty cramped down here, not a lot of room. This is about as much room as there ever is when it's empty. It's like living inside a, uh, inside a, a bass drum. It's incredibly noisy down here. It's all hollow, there's nothing to absorb the sound. You've got winches going, grinding around on deck the whole time. Okay. Sails being moved There's around, the guys talking, yelling. So it's actually a real relief when they start the generator once or twice a day and there's a, what we call a white noise. It's just one noise, it, it helps you sleep really well. And this is where the cooking's done. This is gimbaled so when we're leaning over it, uh, the uh, food doesn't spill out, or it's not supposed to spill out, but um, it usually spills out absolutely everywhere. So the little camber cooker down here, we just turn it on. We have a pressure cooker that sits in here. In goes the uh, freeze-dried food, a little bit of water, heat it up for five minutes, beautiful. And round the side here, we've got the throne. This is where we like to interview our skipper, Neil McDonald. It's one of his favourite spots on the boat. It's a very uh, conveniently located little number. Toilet gimbals uh, either way up to weather or down to leeward. This is the pump. We've got a little foot pump down here, so you pump in the uh, pump in the water to flush it out and you pump everything out and you can also sit on this one while you're sitting on down here hanging on getting thrown off waves it's a little bit flatter you can lean over and cook dinner as well so it's quite a functional area of the boat can have a chat to the boys in the bunk cook dinner and of course it's a great spot for uh, carrying out interviews 
It's also like living inside a fridge down here, the condensation, the water dripping down on top of you, because you've got to remember it's quite warm in here and very cold out there. So any air that we have comes and condenses on the roof of the boat and drips down on top of you. So you're never ever dry in here. It's like living in, a, in an old fridge. And of course, we have to have a look at the bunks and where do you sleep? This is what we call a coffin. And uh, somebody has to get up here every time he wants to go to sleep. So I'll climb in and uh, you can give you some idea of what it's like. Over the top of your mate, he's sleeping underneath you. And remember, if your bunk stays like this, you roll out. So up she goes. Very uncomfortable, the coffin. Now you've got to try and get out again. <laughs> Remember that the guy underneath is going to get upset when you stand on his head. <sighs> there you go. I even cracked a sweat just getting in and out of there. One other thing about these yachts is that they're not particularly big. A 60-foot yacht in the open ocean isn't, uh, isn't big at all by today's terms. And just to give you some idea, we'll go down the back of the boat and have a little look around. Well, this is where all the instrumentation is. Um, there's usually two computers in here. Um, you'll probably see that uh, Mark working away in here. Uh, he spends a lot of his time, probably uh, two-thirds of his day in here, working away at these computers. Most of the instrumentation we see around here now is communications equipment. This is what we call a Mini-M, which is um, a little satellite phone. What we most commonly do is actually use it for live media feeds. Um, the guys do radio interviews, talk to journalists, so this is actually a very busy part of the boat. If we have a little look around up here, this is the radar. This is how we spot the, uh, <coughs> spot the icebergs. As we look around here, this is a traditional old marine radio, well not old, but it's old by today's standards. It's called an SSB. It's one every day we report into the other boats with that. That's sort of uh, more nowadays a means of safety and backup. This is a GPS display here. <clears throat> that tells us where we are the whole time. And uh, these other instruments are mostly related to environmental conditions. You've got to remember that the guy that sits in here is um, six foot three. He's a big man. He spends oh, well over three quarters of his day in here every day. There's two computers. All his charts and things are inside here. So even this has been designed to be as light as possible and uh, uh, pretty extreme when you think of the amount of time that uh, one man has to sit in here. One of the last things to have a look at up here is what we call the Iron Curtain. This is a stop of radiation from um, a little satellite dish we have up here. If we lift this up, you can have a look through here. And uh, this is how we talk to ET. This is our satellite dish. So this thing's gambling away up here, warming us all up. Um, this is for safety. This is full of lead so that uh, we don't get radiation while we're in our bunks back there. So this is how we send you all the footage off the boat uh, so you can keep track of us at home in your nice warm armchairs while we're freezing ourselves to, to, to into misery down in the, uh, in the southern ocean. While you're looking up here too, you can see that uh, there's nothing forward of the boat here that we live in or use. We hardly ever come up here, unless we're sinking, to shut these doors, these uh, safety doors that you can see here. The boat's built, broken into uh, two compartments up there which we um, lock off if we start sinking. As, uh, some of the other boats have had the unfortunate um, uh, sort of experience of, uh, of um, almost sinking. The Elbrook in the second leg there, we hope that uh, that never happens to us. So. Uh, that's about all there is to this multi-million dollar race yacht, the, uh, the Arthur Abloy, our home for the next six months. She's been a good ship for the first three, so uh, let's hope there'll be a good one for the next six months. New Zealand is renowned for its beautiful countryside. So, an orienteering competition provided a few of the crews with the perfect opportunity to take in some of the scenery and do some fitness work at the same time. We've got teams of four people made up from the, from the various boats in the regatta. And uh, we're going to put them out there with a map and a compass, two maps and two compasses per team, and two mountain bikes per team. 
So they have to decide, first of all, who's going to ride and who's going to run. Uh, then there are 18 control flags that, that are used in orienteering that are spaced out in the forest, and they have to navigate to each of those points. The team split into two groups, two bikers and two runners. They then had to work out how to divide up the checkpoints so they could cover the ground as quickly as possible. I reckon you guys should just numb straight out here. Yeah. 15, 1, 2, 3. Because that's all easy going and it's all track. Points near the um, near the hard surface as well, and furthest distances away will take the bikes, and the, obviously the ones that are a bit more cross country will do on foot. The thing is, the, the ones that the, our runners are going to do, um, so obviously we don't know what the terrain is, so yeah, they might get a little bit uh, later than the other, I suppose. Yeah. Once they'd completed the course, they were given a puzzle. They had to solve it to find the treasure. Yeah, you've all got to go, you've all got to go. Run. Yep, run, no bikes. An exhausted Volvo Ocean Race team got there first. And returned to base to open their prize. Teamwork, tactics, Teamwork, and getting tactics. very, very wet. The rest of the teams were left wondering where they'd gone wrong. The runners were probably, I think they got lost between two checkpoints. They went up the wrong valley over here. And I think that cost them to about 10 minutes, they said. So uh, that was probably what made, um, well, made the difference. We were looking pretty good. I went off to the parking and we did the same course as the guys who walked. And we were like 10 minutes ahead of them. But then our runners got lost a bit. All of the teams managed to find the barbecue and a hot and tiring day was finished with a swim in the lake. It's very effective. The x-rays tell the story. Rossfield's broken ribs haven't healed and he's still in a lot of pain from a back injury. Going into the Southern Ocean would make this even worse. It was bad enough on the last leg. Yet despite these problems, he's determined to be on the start line, whatever the long-term risks. We need to do very well in this next event. So, you know, yes, it, it's not going to cause any more damage, but it will be very, very painful. Um, well, I don't think it's going to cause any more damage, but it, it will be a very, very painful leg. Having dropped from second to third in the overall standings on the last leg, News Corp do need a result, and with three previous races under his belt, Ross is an experienced tactician and navigator. But his physical health is not good, and he needs to rest. But he's determined to go. He's had several injections in his spine to reduce the swelling and numb the pain, and he feels it's a risk worth taking. I'm sure I'll be in good shape. I'm in the gym, training, getting injections, got a brace, and, you know, should be right. Whether it will do any long-term damage, only time will tell. But he's entered this race for the fourth time purely to win. And that's his aim, no matter what the cost. Coming up next time, the start of leg four back into the Southern Ocean.